morning. So when I think about feedback, I think about approaching life as a conversation, a conversation that involves listening as well as talking. I'm thinking of listening to words, of course, but also to actions. Are we open to hearing the reactions we receive, and are we willing to adapt? I want to start with an example of personal feedback for me. One night, my older son was reading Harry Potter out loud to me, and while he was reading, I looked down at my iPhone. I intended to just sneak a glance, but I ended up reading a whole email. He noticed, of course, and he put his hand on my chin and turned my head back toward him. So lots of possible ways I could react in that situation. Who, me? No, I wasn't reading. Uh, I can totally read and listen at the same time. Don't worry about it. Or, uh, you know, enough already. Go to bed. It's past your bedtime. So lots of possible ways to react. The opportunity is to take in the feedback and decide how you're going to adapt to it. A very smart art teacher told me that she had learned during critiques of her work to, no matter what was said, swallow, breathe, and say thank you, working to find value in even the harshest of criticism, even when it feels like a punch to the gut. Because don't you want to know? Feedback starts with being open to change. Are you interested? In improvement? That's where engagement begins. And improvement leads to better relationships, whether you're talking about personal relationships or between a business and a customer. It's a little bit like being on a date. So if you're on a date with a vampire and you start to ask him questions, why are you so cold? Why are your eyes bright red? Why aren't you eating? You have to filter, right, and decide, am I annoying him with all of my questions? Should I just back off or is this OK? Or maybe you're sharing a sloppy plate of spaghetti and you think, oh, I have this really cute idea about sharing spaghetti, but I don't know. Will she find it gross or am I doing OK? You're watching for cues. You have to be at least a little vulnerable to have a successful date, right? You have to be willing to pick up on cues and see how you're doing. Should I tell more stories about my cat or is he getting a little freaked out? <laughs> Another way to look at this is being adaptable. As a professor and as a parent, I try to teach adaptability because I think it leads to resiliency. Life is not about things going perfectly the first time. It's about how we adapt to what we receive. So my feedback can feel to my students and to my kids like roadblocks or at least speed bumps. And I hope to teach them that speed bumps are a natural part of life to be navigated rather than letting them shut you down. The friction we encounter is a natural part of life. Friction makes us suitable spouses, better friends, more productive employees, more successful creators. We just have to learn how to deal with that friction. So I want to talk for a minute about what friction and feedback has felt like lately in the business that I love. I'm in the news business, and I refer to it like a business, even though I'm not on the business end of things, because I like to get a paycheck. I prefer to do work that people find value in and will pay for. So the journalism that I'm a part of is very mission driven. It's very, uh, you know, we're in it because we want, we think that what we do can improve lives, can help people live their lives, can help communities function. If we were in the news business just to make money, we would get very creative with pictures of giant cats. And if I were going to get very creative with pictures of giant cats, it would be pretty clear that my metric for success would be how many newspapers I sold. Because my other metric for success is whether I have improved lives and helped people navigate their communities, the metrics for success are much more complicated. Determining what those metrics are is also complicated. Too often, we tend to decide by ourselves. Well, you know, we find and our neighbors find what we're doing to be really valuable and useful, so we should just keep doing that. This is a scene from the TV show Mad Men where they're trying to decide how to sell dog food so they bring in customers and their dogs and watch through a two-way mirror while they eat dog food. So this is the kind of small sample size that news used to work off of. What we know is what people, we bring people in on a Tuesday night, we give them free cookies, and they tell us what they want to see in the news. They'll often say they want more world news, not more celebrity news, and then we'll make all these decisions about what we put on the front page based on what these people told us, not how they behaved,
but what they told us and what they thought we wanted to hear. We've come a long way, and especially with online readership, I would have to actively work to avoid all the feedback I have available to me about how people consume my products. I can know how many came, of course, but where they came from, where they live, what other stories they read, how long they spent, what they're searching for. So talk about instant feedback. While my newsroom is critiquing a beautifully produced three-minute video story, I can look and see whether readers also found value in spending their three minutes with that story or if they got bored halfway through. Instant feedback. And don't you want to know? I can also ask anytime I want, how am I doing? So during a recent snowstorm, when we were publishing a lot more on social media than usual, we ask, how are we doing? Is that too much? And we get instant feedback. People will also give us feedback when we don't ask. So as we're debating, how do you share Olympics results without spoiling it for people who want to wait and watch on TV? Somebody amplifies our message and says, hey, this is how you do it, right on. So the question is, are we listening? And are we willing to take feedback like this and incorporate it into how we make decisions. Readers these days expect a response. This is a case of somebody sending me and sending my newsroom a question about a local news event. Well, I love that. Don't you want them to expect a response? Isn't that valid? That's part of listening. I want the kind of relationship with my community that is an actual conversation, that is not we leave room for people to talk and then we walk away and let them talk and don't take what they're saying back into account and don't participate in the conversation ourselves. This is an email I got from a reader just last week. Since you're the only one I know on staff, I'm sending this to you to see if you can check this out for me. It seems a little odd, but a relative forwarded it to me. I wonder if it's something that needs to be brought to the attention of the public. Could you let me know? And what she sent was one of those forwards we all get in our email all the time. This one was about Drano and whether if you combine tin foil and Drano in a soda bottle, whether that could lead to a small explosive device. So she sent that to me. On this day, she hoped that I would be her personal journalist to help her determine whether that was true. Now, we all get a lot of email. I get a couple hundred a day through the newsroom. This one was not sent to the whole newsroom. This one was sent to me. It's a reader I had a small relationship with. She had contributed stories to me in the past. When I correspond with readers, I always include an invitation that is something like, if you see something you think is news, I hope you'll get in touch. So on this day, she got in touch. And she didn't just send it to me for a story. She said, could you let me know? So I take 10 minutes, introduce the lady to Snopes.com. <laughs> Turns out the Drano thing is true, but it has not been reported in Missouri. So I email her back. The message I'm sending to her on that day is, your questions matter. Your priorities matter. When I asked you to get in touch if you had questions, I wasn't being rhetorical. Here's my answer. Your questions matter even if they're inconvenient, even if I disagree with them, even if I think they're irrelevant, even if you're telling me that if I want to stay relevant, I need to adapt. It's no secret that the news industry is changing. It's pretty remarkable how quickly it's changing. Just 15 years ago, I worked in a newsroom where the paper was put together, it was pasted up using X-Acto knives. Long columns of text come out of a printer, you cut it apart, put it together like a giant Tetris game, roll wax on it, shoot a picture, send it to the press. So this is a really specific skill that became obsolete almost overnight. My industry, the work that I love and am passionate about, is partly in the hands of people who have to acknowledge that they're freaked out acknowledge that their skills might not be as relevant as they used to be, and choose to adapt. Choose to get excited by possibilities. Choose to take the friction and let it smooth you out. My industry is partly in the hands of people who choose to be Tigger, not Eeyore. People who choose to zig and zag, who choose to have energy, who choose to engage, not who see a roadblock and sit down and give up. So if you want to know if what you're doing is working, if you're meeting the needs of the people around you, whether that's your customers or your nine-year-old, just ask. Feedback begins with being open to change. And if there's one thing I've learned from feedback, 
It's that listening to Harry Potter is better than reading email. Thank you.